on World News Tonight. New reigns. India creates history as the nation elects a tribal woman as president for the first time. Testing positive. Another add-on to the COVID case list in America as President Biden tests positive. And a big step. ECB surprises markets with a rate increase to address inflation for the first time in 11 years. And a mud bath. Koreans open up the summer mud festival to bring out the inner child within. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. And we start off with the updates in Ukraine. Residents of Mariupol say conditions have improved somewhat since fighting ended two months ago for control of the port city with victory for Russia. But they say the overall situation remains dire. The fighting for control of the strategic port city of Mariupol ended two months ago with a victory for Russia. Thousands were killed and hundreds of thousands were forced to flee. Those who stayed behind now face a new battle, how to survive among its ruins. Recently visited Mariupol and were free to speak to locals. They were not escorted by Russian-backed officials. Mariupol once was home to 430,000 people. Only tens of thousands remain. The United Nations says 90% of the city's buildings were destroyed in Russia's attempt to dislodge Mariupol's defenders. A top official from the world body said last month 1,348 civilians were killed. Kyiv puts that number at 22,000. The World Health Organization and Ukrainian officials warned that without running water or a functioning sewage system, Mariupol is at risk of a cholera outbreak as rubbish and human remains rot under the summer heat. Despite the hardships, some said they welcomed Moscow's rule. Some residents said they recognized things had got a little better since the fighting ended, but said that overall, the situation remained dire. Russia restored critical glass supplies Europe through Germany via the Nord Stream pipeline after 10 days of maintenance, but suspicion lingered that the Kremlin would trigger an energy crisis on the continent this winter. Europe's energy future is being played out under the Baltic Sea. The Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which has been open since 2011, is proving to be a major concern. Spanning over 1,200 kilometres, it links Germany and Russia and has a total capacity of 55 billion cubic metres per year. In 2021, 40% of Russian gas imports to the European Union transited through this channel. But with the war in Ukraine, energy has become a geopolitical tool. Moscow has been reducing exports since June, sowing doubt on the restart of deliveries, claiming it was due to maintenance work. However, it remains to be seen whether the situation will return to normal. The gas will flow to Europe via Nord Stream 1, but judging by the declarations of the Russian leader, it will probably be in reduced capacity, maybe only 40%. There is no justification for this reduction. Moscow maintains a turbine issue caused it to slow delivery rates, but Berlin has called it a political decision. In June, Germany was still buying 35% of its gas from Russia compared to 55% four months earlier. European countries are finding it difficult to adapt as they attempt to wean themselves off Russian energy. Brussels has asked all 27 member states to slash their gas use by 15% beginning in August. And also there has been a dramatic development amidst uh, Russia's ongoing assault against Ukraine. The co two countries are poised to seal a deal to ensure the exports of Ukrainian grain to help address the global shortage. Turkey was able to succeed where others have failed over the past five months by brokering an agreement between Russia and Ukraine. While the agreement won't halt Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, it will relieve a global food crisis caused by blocked Black Sea grain exports as a result of the war. The agreement, which was said to be signed formally on Friday, comes amid soaring global food prices and the threat of starvation for people in some of the world's poorest countries. The agreement was made possible thanks to talks being held by officials of the two countries in Istanbul last week, with Turkish and UN officials in attendance. 
Despite previous denials from the Kremlin, Russia has been preventing Ukrainian ports from exporting grain, causing a massive food supply shortage as Ukraine is one of the world's biggest grains exporters. Under the terms of the deal, shipments could resume from three ports under full Ukrainian control before possibly being expanded further. In response, U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price welcomed the news but insisted it was a problem caused by Moscow in the first place. The fact is that to date Russia has weaponized uh, food during this conflict. Uh, they have destroyed agricultural facilities. They prevented uh, millions of tons of Ukrainian grain from getting to, to those who need it. Uh, as I said, we welcome the announcement of this agreement in principle, but what we're focusing on now uh, is holding Russia accountable for implementing uh, this agreement and for enabling uh, Ukrainian grain to get to world markets. Under the agreement, the safety of the shipments would be overseen by a UN monitoring group based in Istanbul. However, Ukraine remains skeptical, saying that Russian ships should not be allowed into Ukrainian waters as part of the anticipated agreement. An Indian woman politician from a tribal community, Draupadi Murmu, created history by becoming the new president of India. Murmu was nominated by the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party and was served as governor of Eastern Jharkhand State. Celebrations broke out, especially in tribal majority states, where people danced to the beats of drums and burst firecrackers. Murmu, a veteran politician who has held senior posts in Odisha, is India's first tribal president and the second ever female president. Born in a family of the Santa tribe, Murmu stated that her career as a school teacher and actively participated on tribal rights issues. She later joined mainstream politics and served as a lawmaker and governor of the eastern state of Jharkhand. The Indian constitution provides a largely ceremonial role for the president with the prime minister and his cabinet holding executive powers. The European Central Bank has developed its first interest rate hike in over a decade, joining its global peers in the race to get on top of surging inflation. The European Central Bank decided Thursday to raise its interest rates by a larger than expected half percentage point. The bank's first rate hike in 11 years, which now takes its key interest rate to zero percent. I think, you know, it's the first time in over a decade that we raise interest rates. And uh, moving out of negative interest rates, by all accounts, certainly to me, uh, is going to facilitate a number of things that we can explain to European citizens uh, in order to help them understand what we are trying to do in order to reduce inflation and in order to procure price stability. The bold move comes as continuing inflation, which hit a record 8.6 percent in June, adds to concerns about growth, while the Eurozone is still suffering from the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Amid a continued increase in consumer prices, the ECB had previously signaled it would be increasing rates in July and September. But it was unclear whether it would go as far as rising rates to zero. The bank's deposit rate is now 0 percent, the main refinancing operations rate is 0.5 percent, and the marginal lending facility is at 0.75 percent. The ECB also announced that it would provide extra help for the 19 country currency blocks more indebted countries like Italy through a new bond purchase scheme. This, it says, is aimed at capping the rise in their borrowing costs and limiting financial fragmentation. Following the announcement, the euro rose to a session high on Thursday to trade at a dollar and two cents. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight and now we cross over to the United States. The 90 million COVID cases that were recorded in America through the pandemic, another American president was included. White House official and President Biden himself offering an upbeat assessment of his condition after routine COVID tests came out positive. The diagnosis comes as the country faces a wave of new infections. Hey folks, guess you heard this morning I tested positive for COVID. U.S. President Joe Biden tested positive on Thursday for COVID-19. 
In a short video on Twitter sharing the news, Biden said he was so far feeling fine. But I've been double vaccinated, double boosted. Symptoms are mild. And, uh, and I really appreciate your inquiries and your concerns. The president's physician, Dr. Kevin O'Connor, said Biden's symptoms so far included a runny nose, fatigue, and an occasional dry cough. O'Connor said Biden has begun taking the antiviral treatment Paxlovid. He sounded great. I asked him, you know, Mr. President, how are you feeling? He said, I'm feeling fine. Dr. Ashish Jha, who leads the White House's COVID-19 response team, told reporters at a briefing he'd spoken with Biden and Dr. O'Connor. He said the president's oxygen levels were normal, that he was working, and would isolate for five days and return to public events once he had a negative COVID test. Dr. Jha said it was not yet clear which variant had infected the president, but that results of the sequencing should be known within days. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said that the BA5 Omicron subvariant is currently driving a surge in cases. CDC data show U.S. infections are up 25 percent in the last month. Biden has received two booster shots of a COVID-19 vaccine, the most recent one in March. But the BA5 subvariant has proven capable of evading the immune protection from either vaccination or prior infection. Dr. Jha said there was no reason to expect Biden's case might worsen. He is breathing well, his oxygen level is normal, uh, and he's, you know, I was going to say resting comfortably. He's actually not resting comfortably. He's working comfortably uh, in his residence. Biden set up strict COVID-19 safety protocols at the White House, urged Americans to take the virus seriously, and campaigned for everyone to get fully vaccinated. Get your shots, get your boosters. The White House has said Biden is tested regularly for the disease and anyone who meets with him or travels with him is tested beforehand. Biden had last tested negative on Tuesday. He joins a roster of world leaders infected by the illness. Former President Donald Trump, before he was vaccinated, was hospitalized in October 2020 and underwent aggressive treatment at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center after his low oxygen levels alarmed his doctors. More than one million people have died from COVID in the United States. U.S. President Joe Biden plans to speak with his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping in the coming few weeks at the moment of the simmering tensions between the countries over Taiwan and trade. But of course, this comment was made before President Biden was tested positive for COVID-19. U.S. President Joe Biden said on Wednesday he expects to speak with Chinese President Xi Jinping by the end of the month. I think I'll be talking to President Xi within the next 10 days. The long-discussed call would be their first since March. Washington calls Beijing its main strategic rival and said high-level engagement was key to maintaining stability and keeping away from conflict. The impending call also comes at a crucial moment as Biden considers lifting some Trump-era tariffs on Chinese goods worth hundreds of billions of dollars to reduce inflation at home. And as tensions continue to simmer over the status of Taiwan. Biden's administration has reiterated what it called its rock-solid commitment to the island's security. But on Wednesday, Biden appeared to cast doubt on a reported planned visit to the island by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi next month. The military thinks it's not a good idea right now, but uh, I, I don't know what the status of it is. Beijing, which claims the democratically ruled island as its own, said on Tuesday it would respond with forceful measures if Pelosi did visit Taiwan. If Speaker Pelosi visits Taiwan, it will seriously violate the One China policy and the provisions of the three China-U.S. joint communiques, seriously undermine China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, seriously impact the political foundation of China-U.S. relations, and send a seriously wrong signal to the separatist forces of Taiwan independence. Pelosi's office declined to comment on whether the visit is moving forward, citing security concerns. Plans for the trip were reported by the Financial Times, which said the White House had also expressed concerns. Still in the United States, now to the new criminal investigation just launched into these deleted Secret Service text messages that the January 6th committee has been demanding. It comes as the committee is set to hold another primetime hearing. Tonight, as the January 6th committee prepares to roll out what amounts to its closing argument for now against former President Trump, the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General revealing a criminal investigation has been launched into deleted text messages the committee requested from the Secret Service. The Secret Service has said there was no malicious action in the destruction of the messages, saying it was part of a pre-planned maintenance on all phones, though acknowledge agents had been asked three times to preserve their data. 
that the backdrop to tonight's high stakes hearing where the committee plans to recreate 187 minutes of the attack when they say Mr. Trump waited nearly three hours before delivering this message to his supporters. Go home. We love you. You're very special. And while he said this a day later. To those who engage in the acts of violence and destruction, you do not represent our country. Committee members say expect to see outtakes showing what they call Mr. Trump's resistance to condemning rioters. This was a dereliction of duty of the president. And committee member Adam Kinzinger releasing new video of White House officials, including former White House counsel Pat Cipollone, describing the president watching it all unfold. Was the, the violence capital visible on the screen on the, on the television? Yes. Tesla reported a smaller than expected drop in quarterly profit as a string of price increases on its electric vehicles helped offset production challenges caused by lockdowns in China. Tesla on Wednesday ended its streak of posting record quarterly revenues. But its drop in profit was smaller than expected, with a string of price hikes on its electric vehicles helping to offset production challenges caused by COVID-19 lockdowns in China. The EV maker reported a total revenue of $16.93 billion in the second quarter, down from $18.76 billion a quarter earlier. Chief executive Elon Musk said he expects inflation to start easing by end 2022 and most commodity prices to stabilize. On an earnings call, Musk dismissed the idea that global economic problems were hurting interest in Tesla, despite vehicle prices rising to what he called embarrassing levels. The U.S. price of Tesla's Model Y long-range version, now just shy of $66,000, is up more than 30 percent since the start of 2021. Musk insisted Tesla does not have a demand problem, but a production problem. Tesla's China factory ended the second quarter with a record monthly production level. Musk said new factories in Berlin and Texas aim to produce 5,000 cars a week by the end of the year. The company's executives acknowledged supplies of older generation microchips remained tight, but said there were no major problems in supplies of chips and batteries, barring unforeseen COVID-related shutdowns. Chief Financial Officer Zachary Kirkhorn said Tesla was still pushing to reach 50 percent growth in deliveries this year. He added that while the target had become more difficult, quote, it remains possible with strong execution. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Nine civilians, including at least two children, were killed in Iraq's Duhok province where the Turkish foreign minister has denied reports that Turkey carried out attacks targeting civilians. The African continent will launch a large-scale malaria vaccination in the coming years with funds worth 160 million US dollars from the Global Alliance of Vaccines and Immunization. Japan warned of escalating national security threats, including repercussions from Russia's war with Ukraine, Chinese intimidation of Taiwan and vulnerable technology supply chains in its annual defense white paper. The eldest child of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and the third in line to the throne, Prince George celebrates his ninth birthday. The European Union is predicting a tough year for wildfires and is in talks to buy firefighting planes. Thousands of firefighters across southern Europe were battling to contain hundreds of wildfires ranging from Portugal to France. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we are leaving you tonight with a look at one of the biggest summer events in South Korea that gives everyone a chance to dance around in mud. Stay safe and have a good night.